Daniel Burris is one of the world's leading technology forecasters and business strategists, helping clients better understand how technological, social, and business forces are converging to create enormous untapped opportunities. He has established a worldwide reputation for his exceptional record of accurately predicting the future of technological change and its direct impact on business. The New York Times has referred to Daniel Burris as one of the top three business gurus in the highest demand as a speaker. In 1993, that was two years before Yahoo, two years before Amazon.com, two years before the web started taking off. Wasn't on your radar. Two years before, even Amazon.com wasn't even thought of yet by the guy who, who came up with it. I was giving a speech to the American Booksellers Association. There were 10,000 people in that audience, far bigger than this 4,000. And you can still get the old audio tape. That's how they did it in those days. You can still get the old audio tape of that speech, and you can hear me clearly say, in two years, there's going to be a virtual bookstore. And I basically described Amazon.com. Now, was I able to predict the company would be called Amazon.com? No, I had to leave out the parts I could be wrong about. <laughs> but I knew it was going to happen. How could I know that? Because the technology was there to do it, and if it can be done, it will be done. Now, I know what you're thinking. Yeah, but I'm not a technology forecaster. That's not what I do. Oh, yeah, well, there's a lot that I can give you. Again, you don't have to be a scientist. You just have to become aware of what's going on. When your customers start changing, their behaviors, you better be paying attention. Have they been changing their behaviors over the last couple of years? Yeah, yeah. If you got an iPod, what happened? Hey, you changed. Once you got a cell phone, what happened? You were changed. Once you got email, what happened? Hey, you were changed. And by the way, you're not going back. You're going forward. Once you get an iPod, what happens? It doesn't just change how you listen to music. It transforms how you listen to music. It's not just change. Change was going from a round record to a round CD. It still was a tangible physical thing with moving parts and you still had to go find it. When you talk about an iPod player, you know what? You're transforming how you listen to music. And we've just begun to transform how we live, work, and play. Maybe we ought to think about this. You see, when we go to customers and we ask our customers, what would you like, and we give it to them, we miss the biggest opportunity that ever happened on the planet. Why? Still under ask. Why? They don't know what's technically possible. Nobody ever asked for an iPod. Nobody ever asked for an adjustable uh, windshield wiper. And if you talk to GE, the people that invented the self-cleaning oven, they'll tell you no housewife ever asked for one, or house husband. No one asked for one. Most of the stuff that we do, no one asked for. So am I saying we should not talk to customers? No, no, no. I think we should talk to customers, ask them what they'd like, but realize that our competition is asking people, what would you like? getting the same answer, and if we all deliver the same solution, we're all commoditized and competing on price. Frankly, I don't like competing on price. I, think, I mean, it's okay, you can do it if you want, but it's a tough game out there. I want to intentionally decommoditize my commodities. Matter of fact, you can even decommoditize electricity. Now, most of us in this room know there's only one kind of electricity, but I was working with some major utilities, and they decided to have two kinds of electricity, the inexpensive stuff and the expensive stuff the low margin stuff and the high margin stuff. They called the high margin electricity digital electricity. Now you might be thinking, so what? Who would pay for it? Here's what they did. They said, if you're a company and you want that electricity to never fluctuate because your equipment is important to you and you don't want fluctuations, and if there's a power outage, it will not go out to you. You will always have electricity. We call that digital electricity and it'll cost you more. Who started signing up? Well, Microsoft, Intel, Google, Yahoo, IBM, and then all of a sudden it started going beyond just technology companies. It started going into other giant companies that wanted their technology to be secure. In other words, you can even decommoditize electricity. How do they do it? They wrapped a service wrapper around it. I was speaking to Miracle Ear not long ago. Miracle Ear makes hearing aids. They're one of the biggest on the planet. They've got people in all the Sears stores and all around the country that can fit that hearing aid in your ear so that it's comfortable, doesn't hurt, and they can adjust it for your hearing loss. Now, you might think this is a great stock. What a great company. Let's face it, there's 78 million baby boomers that listen to Jimi Hendrix. Cool. So they're deaf. You know, they're going deaf. 
And then we also know that young people, 20-somethings, they go by, their windows are rolled up, and their car's going boom, boom, boom. So you know, they're deaf, they're shot. And my sister teaches at Vanderbilt University, and they were doing a study last year. They needed 100 students that had normal hearing, and they had to drop the study. They couldn't find 100 that had normal hearing. True. All right. So you might think, miracle ear, sounds good. But you know what? Miracle ear's got trouble. What's the trouble? If you're a baby boomer, you'd rather be deaf than, than wear a hearing aid. It makes you look old. What? You'd rat Anyway. And... Uh, <clears throat> So you get the idea, what are we going to do here? So when I was talking to them, one of the things I was talking about is both and, and how telephones, of course phones, are going to have, continue to have screens. Matter of fact, with light emitting diodes, you can pull a little screen out so we can see it, work with it and all that. Of course, but we also, a phone is meant for talking and listening. So we'll also be just talking and listening on those things. As a matter of fact, through miniaturization and some breakthroughs that are taking place, we're making it so that it's what? So that it fits in your ear. So it's got a micro GPS chip that uh, companies are developing right now that works in there. So what is it? What's the problem with the phone companies? I told Miracle here, here's the problem. They got nobody that can fit that thing in there. What you need to do is to partner with somebody and create the Miracle earphone. So now you're not creating a hearing aid for somebody who has bad hearing. Rather, you're, you're getting a phone that can fit in there. However, we can do Audio enhancement. <laughs> Can you get surround sound right now? I could give you surround sound, except you'd have to buy two. Is there a difference between informing and communicating? Poof, yeah. Informing is one way, it's static, this knows cause action. Communicating is two way and causes action. It's dynamic. I think we have information age chains information age organizations. We're really good at informing, but how good are we at actually communicating, which actually causes change in behaviors? We have amazing communication age tools out there, but we're using them with an information age mindset. The future of IT is to integrate information and communication. What I'd like us to do is to spend some time as opportunity managers. See, I know what's happening to your desks while you're at this meeting, right? They're piling up. Piling up. When you go back, you're going to pay the meeting penalty fee. We've got to dig out of the mess that was caused because we're here. And what are we looking forward to? Digging out to getting back to the way it was before we left, which means there was no value in coming. <laughs> Let's not do that. It's a trap. Here's what I'd like you to try. Look, this is not for me. This is for you. Try this. It'll take one hour a week of your time. I know what you're thinking. Hey, I don't have an hour. I'm busy. Yeah, that's why you don't have an hour. You've never done this. One hour a week. And by the way, if you don't put it in your calendar, it won't happen. Why? You'll be putting out another fire. In this hour that you put in your calendar and you do and you make an appointment with yourself, I would like you to unplug from the present and plug into your future, the visible future, the hard trend future, the future that's got certainty to it. Get rid of the stuff you're uncertain about. Ask yourself, what are the things I know? What are the opportunities coming our way? What are the things, instead of all the things I can't do because of my size, what are all the things I can do because I've got an alliance and a team? a team bigger than the people that are just in these four walls. How can I get on the phone and get together with some of the people I met in this meeting so that maybe together we can make things happen that couldn't have happened before? That's how you can drive it.